How do we know when people have arrived? We have four attendees. The four attendees? Yeah. So we'll begin when? Now we have seven. <laughs> now we have seven, okay. How long should we should we take before we begin? And should I just start or should we give instructions about about translation? And start now. Okay. We can start now. Maybe we'll maybe we should give one more minute before we begin. We have ten attendees now. Ten attendees. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think most of the things that I attend, people we should come on now and say. We're allowing two more minutes for people to add on, you know, welcome, thank you, um, so that they don't think they've tuned in on the wrong day. Well, mm -hmm. hi, hi, everyone, then, in that case. Uh, and you just kind of did sent the message. I'll resend it. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to take a couple of more minutes for people to sign on. It's 1101. We'll, we'll get started around 1103. Um, in the meantime, if you are someone who needs translation and yet can understand this um, uh, our trans our interpreter David will uh, share information about translation. Um, okay, so it's eleven o two. Okay, the instructions for translation are in the chat, if you need it. Um, the speakers will be speaking in English, so if that works for you, no translation is needed. Um, it's 11, it's 11.03. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're delighted uh, to be having this webinar. Um, my name is Jesse Levine. I'll be moderating today. Um, I'm Senior Advocacy Officer for Scholars at Risk. Uh, I'm very happy to be speaking with you all today. And I'm thrilled with the panel that we've gathered uh, to discuss a growing trend that threatens academic freedom in the Americas and around the world. Um, I'd first like to thank our hosts and partners at the University of Ottawa Human Rights Research and Education Center, other members of the Coalition for Academic Freedom in the Americas, and the United Faculty of Florida. I'll begin today by providing a brief introduction of our discussion. Then I'll introduce our three distinguished panel, panelists who will each have about 15 to 20 minutes to present. And the remaining half hour or so will be for audience questions, which you should feel free to place in the chat. My colleague from the Coalition for Academic Freedom in the, in the Americas, Catalina Arango, will curate your questions and share them with the panelists. Please feel free to share your questions throughout the webinar. Um, okay, for those who don't know, uh, the Coalition for Academic Freedom in the Americas is led by the University of Ottawa, Canada, University of Monterey in Mexico, and my organization, Scholars at Risk, together with a growing group of scholars, students, and other members of the higher education community, with the goal, the common goal of responding to the growing problem of threats to academic freedom throughout the Western Hemisphere. Scholars at Risk has spent the better part of the past decade monitoring and tracking violations of academic freedom and attacks on higher education around the world. We do this for a few reasons. First uh, is to gather qualitative data, which allows us to better understand and help others understand the magnitude of the problem of attacks on higher education. And make no mistake, it is a growing problem. In our most recent annual report, which we call Free to Think, we documented 391 discrete attacks on higher education or violations of academic freedom, the most in any report to date. Our monitoring work also allows us to identify and document global, regional, and national trends as they occur. 
And finally, monitoring allows us to assess where efforts to protect, to protect higher education are succeeding and where they're falling short. All of this forms the foundation of our advocacy work within the UN, in regional bodies like the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, in courts, before legislatures, in, in institutions, and with the public. So we have this global perspective. And we can see where countries are getting worse, when countries hit bottom in terms of protection for academic freedom, and on rare occasions when they improve in their respect for academic freedom. But the phenomenon that we're here to talk about today doesn't exactly follow the normal pattern that we've seen in recent years. We're not just talking about fluctuations in the numbers of generic human rights violations against scholars, such as imprisonments, wrongful imprisonments, I should say, or restrictions on academic movement or violations or, or, or violent attacks. Um, what we're seeing instead is authoritarian leaders who seem to be drawing from the exact same playbook, copycatting each other's very specific tactics and even drawing from the same script. I think it's important at the outset that we be very specific about exactly what those tactics are and what that script says. Um, so without, without purporting to uh, be listing all of the tactics, here are a few. First, we've seen that leaders start uh, by making populist attacks on higher education with the public. These claims are once again, very specific and repeated across countries. At their core is the argument that certain disciplines, and especially gender studies in particular, are worthless. Often these same attacks include a neoliberal kind of insistence that only those fields that are tied directly to high income professions or hard scientists, sciences have any value. We've seen these exact claims from Victor Orban, Orban Ron DeSantis, and others. These populist attacks then lay the groundwork for actual policies targeting higher education spaces. Those policies and, and sort of policy level decisions uh, include executives installing their political allies in positions of power within universities, often over the objections of the university communities themselves. They include efforts to eliminate or defund specific disciplines. They include Orwellian claims that free speech is under assault on campuses and the only way to protect it is to ban certain ideas. And at the extreme end, um, these attacks include institution, institutional takeover or outright closure of universities. We've seen remarkably similar versions or some or, of some or all of these ta tactics in Hungary, as well as, as now in the United States and in India, Russia, Poland, Brazil, Venezuela, and Mexico, among others. I would suggest that there's a common motivation at the core of these attacks. Rather than destroying higher education with blunt force, it seems to me that what's driving these attacks is the desire by autocrats and authoritarians and their allies to remake higher education spaces in their own images. And I would further suggest that the most important common thread that runs through all of these tactics, the thing that's most under attack is university autonomy. And that presents a challenge because university autonomy is seldom a part of the pub public conversation about the attacks that we've seen in Hungary, in Florida and elsewhere. We don't say often, often enough that university autonomy is an indispensable component of academic freedom and that academic freedom while deeply intertwined with freedom of expression is not the same thing as freedom of expression. By failing to name the problem with precision, we open the figurative campus gates to leaders who at the most basic level are operating under the premise that they, and not the faculty, students, and other higher education community members um, who, who are affected, that these leaders are the ones best equipped to say how a university should be run, how knowledge should be produced, how students should be taught, and what ideas have value. Without precision regarding the specific rights that are under attack, we are ill-equipped to respond. We are extremely fortunate today to have with us three panelists who are well-equipped to name the problem with precision. 
and who have both personal knowledge and deep political understanding of these phenomena and have thought deeply about how we can respond. Our first panelist, Andres Pop, is research professor and head of the Department for Constitutional Administrative Law at the Et Etos Loran Research Network, formerly Hungar Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Center for Social Sciences Institute for Legal Studies. He's also a professor of law at the Institute of Business Economics at Ietzvos University in Budapest, as well as an adjunct professor in the Nationalism Studies Program at the Central, Central Uni European University in Vienna. He worked as a rapporteur, consultant, senior expert, project manager, and lead researcher in various projects commissioned by the European Union, Union the Council of Europe, and the UN. He served as an expert witness for courts in the UK and the US and habitually works with international NGOs and think tanks. He's a member of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. In 2018, he founded the International Association of Constitutional Law, research group on identity, race, and ethnicity in constitutional law. Uh, Professor Pop, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. I'm, <clears throat> I am, uh, I'm, I'm truly thrilled and honored to be, to be invited. This is, this is really a, a wonderful opportunity to me, uh, and I, I have to start with you know, two apologies. One is, is personal. I just uh, climbing out of a very banal but very powerful form of a flu. I'm, I'm, I'm so I would not be on the top of my game, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm super happy to, 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 to be with you here. Uh, the other one is a substantive apology. I mean, I, I, I really uh, enjoyed the, the, uh, the title. It's very attractive, but. Uh, as an academic, I have to I have to warn to be very cautious with comparisons and analogies. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with uh, with the starting point that um, illiberals, illiberal politicians, autocrats, autocracies learn from each other. Institutional, political, legal takeovers and battles are are similar, but uh, but as an uh, as a as an as an as an analytic academic, of course, I have to, um, protecting, you know, our reputation, and we have to warn that, you know, okay, but, but there are important, you know, the similarities are just as numerous and important as the similarities. But the reason why I think it's still important to talk about this, so I will begin with, with the similarities, but I will, I will make effort to emphasize the dissimilar the differences between Hungary and, and and all the other examples that can be brought and the reason why I think that's also important from the practical and and also from the emotional and moral point of view is uh is I think that uh, to to see to bring more and more dark pictures of of other depressing regimes and 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 trends is is of course important to, to see that okay um th these are the trends but to see the differences may actually be an empowering uh and and uh, and sort of pave the way for some optimism um to see how the differences are my, my experience in this regard is is in the past month i've been in, in, you know involved in number of discussions in uh, uh discussing and interpreting um Development in Israel, because clearly Netanyahu war bomb perils. I mean, we see people march, you know, masses marching on the streets of Tel Aviv with with huge banners that we are not Orban's country and things like that. So, so yes, the the similarities are very important, but there's also this is what I've always emphasized to my Israeli friends that there are very important differences. Um, just just one other note on on sort of my positionality here. So I'm a I'm a comparative constitutional law person, and uh, a couple of months ago, uh, this is not entirely unusual in, 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 in Central Europe, Eastern Europe. I had I had four jobs, I had four affiliations, and I think I think that these these are they're symbolic. It's it's not about me, but I think it's it's the symbolism. So one of the jobs I one of the affiliations I have is with, uh, and I will talk about this in a bit, is Central European University. This is a double accredited American Hungarian university founded by George Soros, which was ousted, which was expelled from Hungary by a direct uh, legislative action, withdrawing accreditation, singling out this particular institution. So one of the, the teaching positions I have is actually moved, has left the country due to a direct uh, government uh, act, action, which was actually found by the European Court of Justice to be contrary to international law. So that's one of the institutions. The other institution I work for is a, as a researcher was as a research institute under the auspices, which used to be under the auspices of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which is this independent research uh, hub. 
which was uh, which was transformed into a uh, semi public uh, or a public foundation ran by government um, appointees. Um, so it has been the independence of it has been uh, has been taken away. The other institution I work for is is the oldest and the most prestigious public university uh, in Hungary, which is uh, now uh, about two years ago there were twenty. Uh, that there were uh, 32 public universities, public higher education institutions in Hungary. Hungary is a country of 10 million people. Uh, the past month have, have shown an, an unprecedented uh, semi-privatization of public institutions into, some, into a new form of, of public foundations that are basically under direct government control. All the... Um, the, so foundations that uh, the the board and the senator, which is directly appointed by the government for an indefinite time, and twenty six higher education institutions out of the thirty two public ones have been transformed into this form. Okay, uh, so this is my my university is one of the few that has been left. Uh, and by the way, the boards and the senates and uh, the presidents um, most of the times were were so obviously government affiliated uh, people that most of them were actually part of the government. So they were cabinet ministers or, or uh, secretaries of state and stuff like that. Okay. And the last um, uh, appointment I have is that uh, I was asked when this institution was formed uh, um, at the at the to, well, actually, shortly after Viktor Orban's coming into power, they had this idea to create something like uh, the ENA, the École Nationale d'Administration, which was a, a very important institution in France, actually closed now, um, which was basically to be the training house for all government um, employees. So this was supposed to be an elite training uh, place for public servants, etc. So when they, they merged the former police college and the military academy into one institution, I was asked to, to lead one of the, do the doctoral programs in the law enforcement faculty of this, uh, this massive newly created institution. And I have been, uh, a couple of months ago, I've been, uh, I've been fired from that institution uh, for obvious political, uh, for actually for political reasons. Okay, so this is again. I'm not particularly. I'm not interested in this story. What I think that my my position in these institutions is interesting. I actually have written a somewhat subjective essay uh, on this that is to be uh, coming out in a journal of legal education uh, in the summer. Again, it's not my. It's not self promotion. I'm not interesting in the story. I think the dilemmas someone in my position would have in this country is, I think, what what makes it interesting. Um, so let me just very briefly go through what Hungary is and what the Hungarian situation of uh, of, of academic freedom is. So, so I think the Hungarian, the specialty, and I think this is this is where the dissimilarity is important. But but again, the utility, nevertheless, of the Hungarian case is that what happened in Hungary in the past thirteen years is everything has happened within along the lines of law. So there is has always been so a formal adherence to law. This is this is what is usually referred to as abusive constitutionalism. So these regimes, and again, Hung Hungarian is not the only one, hijack the vocabulary and the imagination of constitutional democracy. So this is, we see a constitutional, an abusive constitutional borrowing from, from the global constitutional canon. And it also takes place when there are discussions with international and, and, and also sometimes local um, judicial uh, so, so the judicial venue is uh, has 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 limited uh, um, efficiency when when the degree of cynicism of 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 the regime goes beyond a certain point. Uh, Kim Lim Shapley from Princeton called what what has happened in the constitutional uh, uh, dimension as the Frank a creation of a Franken state. So basically, what has happened is that these well trained. Uh, legislators or think tanks behind that have put together monster, political monsters from mosaic pieces of completely legitimate institutions. So take a, you take a little bit from the French electoral law, you add a little bit from the British and then a little bit from the Swedish, or again, all are impeccable, and then you can still create a monster. So when we have either international, you know, or, or, or others. And, and, and of course, the Hungarian case is also special in the sense that Hungary is part of the European Union. There is now an unprecedented rule of law conditionality procedure going uh, on against Hungary and Poland because of these rule of law violations. This is something that has been unexpected and 
the EU was unable to you know, deal with this for 13 years. This is not something they would have expected that you have members of the European Union who blatantly are opposed to its fundamental and basic values. It took them 12 years to, to react, which I think is a, is a normal pace for, an inter, for, for such a unique uh, supranational organization. Anyway, so... So, so I think that the, the the legal debate is interesting to follow, but it also shows the the the, the limits of the sort of inst institutional dialogue. Okay, so what uh, what has happened in Hungary? So this is a country that has been on the path of autocracy. Uh, it's a self uh, identified illiberal democracy. This is what the president, uh, Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban, has, has has identified its regime for for thirteen years. Um, and basically, in these thirteen years, well, actually, it actually it, it it was orchestrated within the first few years a complete constitutional state capture. Uh, the within after a mere thirty five days of the debate, a new constitution was uh, was adopted, and the entire constitutional uh, uh, scene was basically taken over by government. Uh, the idea is that uh, it has been staffed with unconditional government loyalists, and the country was basically turned into um, an oligarchized um, state with an oligarchized media, um, the business sector, the elect the judiciary. So practically everything is, is under a very severe encroachment. And of course, education, both higher education as well as public education, uh, included in this uh, issue. So in this in this rule of law conditionality debate a few uh, weeks ago or a month ago, the European Parliament has actually officially stated that Hungary is no longer a democracy. It's a hybrid regime or something like that. Um, also, what we have to uh, you know add about Hungary, that Hungary is a peaceful country. Uh, Orman has been elected with a two-thirds majority in parliament for the fourth time now. A, a year ago was the last election. Uh, this is not Turkey. We don't see academics sent in exile. We don't see passports withdrawn. We don't see it's not Russia. We don't see uh, you know politicians or academics or NGO people poisoned. We don't see imprisonments. But it is a fairly scary, scary uh, place for academics, for entrepreneurs, for opposition politicians, for teachers, for nurses. Uh, for patients, uh, students, and uh, and I will get back to this in a bit. For for parents whose whose kids will leave the country for uh, for university and never return. Okay, what happened? What is the chronology? First, just very briefly in 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 the general, more constitutional terms, and then and then about academic freedom, if I'm allowed. So again, uh, the, the the story began in in the 2010 elections when, with 52 percent of the votes. Um, in an unexpected um, way, Orban's party received the, that translated to 68% of parliamentary mandates. And under Hungarian constitutional law, a two thirds majority allows for uh, the amendment or even the adoption of a new constitution. So basically, after a 35 day long debate, a new constitution was adopted in, uh, in April 2011. Um, and, and the entire, uh, as I said, the entire political arena was taken over. So, for example, the speaker was vested. The, it's the same person. It's one of Orban's closest allies. The same uh, person for the last 13 years was vested with extensive discretionary powers to limit uh, MPs' free uh, free speech. In in Parliament, there are severe fines over you know a monthly salary for uh, for you know for for one uh, statement or one. Um, uh, displaying the EU flag, for example, which was withdrawn the, the first day. Um, we so basically, Parliament has been elaborated from from the political uh, game. Um, um, a very restrictive media law was adopted very soon onwards, which basically uh, allowed government uh, influence to all uh, public service media. And shortly also uh, what has happened as this oligarchic state was developed, I'll talk about this later, is also Private media was basically taken over, bought by by government oligarchs or government friendly oligarchs, including the free tabloid media. So that basically also shows that the that there are very very few media organs, opposition or non government uh, uh, media that that remain. Of course, the internet is there, but internet bubbles are not going to be able to make uh, the the difference. Um, so basically, all nominally independent institutions, whether it's courts, there was a high, very powerful uh, constitutional court 
Uh, so a court, <clears throat> Ombudsman institution, everything was basically staffed by government loyalists. Uh, usually their mandates were extended to minimum nine years, um, and the law said the new constitution cemented them basically in the position saying that, well, uh, they have to be, the, 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 the positions need to be filled with two-thirds majority. If uh, there wouldn't be such a, a majority in parliament, the tenures and the mandates would automatically be prolonged for, you know, uh, forever. We also saw um, electoral reform. Uh, <coughs> Um, with with sort of pushing the regime towards again a form of gerrymandering, but not beyond the you know the the, the limits that would internationally it would it was still considered by the Venice Commission under international uh, watchdog organizations to be well you know not uh, ex extensively beyond the the, um, the the degree of gender mandate that's usually uh, um, seen in any in regimes. Um, what we've seen in 2014, uh, the two-thirds parliamentary majority was uh, gained by 45% of the votes, in 2018 by 48, in 2020 by 51%. So uh, this is the the the, uh, the specialty of the Hungarian electoral system, that if, if someone gets close to or, or, or short, you know, uh, around around 50% of the votes, that actually translates to a two-thirds majority. Again, it's a, it is a double-edged sword. In theory, this would also mean that Viktor Orban could be outvoted, right? Um, now, what we'll see is that, uh, or our experience has been that it's, if, if this regime is ever going to be uh, um, uh, abandoned, that's highly unlikely to take you know the place of uh, of elections, but I get back to this in uh, in a bit. Okay, academic freedom. What has happened uh, about academic freedom? I've I've identified eighteen points. I, I will be very you know try to be short. Um, so eighteen. Um, and again, this is uh, if you have an illiberal regime taking place, academic freedom will be one of the uh, obviously one of the. Uh, the areas where uh, where infringements would be focused on. So what has happened, this, this is not in the order of importance. In fact, my two favorite or most important points are the last ones. But um, so what, what, what has happened? First, bringing independent public research institutions, such as the one I work for, under a more direct government control. Although I have to say that the management of, of my institution is now under direct government control, I have not experienced, nor have my colleagues experienced yet, any uh, influence into what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're publishing, but it's, you know, it can happen every moment. Um, two, adopting legislation limiting government agencies to provide information or excessively charge for public data requests. This would not seem like something that uh, is, is, is intrinsically connected to academic freedom, but we see that one of the way, this is, if we don't have data, social science research uh, is, is, uh, is suffocated by that. Okay, more directly, university autonomy curtailed through legislation re reorganizing financial management with government appointed chancellors. This did not seem like, this is something that the Orban regime initiated fairly early onwards. It didn't seem like such a big thing. Okay, chancellors, we're talking about public universities, but chancellors are basically holding the key to uh, to the uh, cash box. Um, so this this actually proved to be a very powerful form of control. Okay, very shortly after, this was more direct, controlling the election of rectors of public universities. So laws were adopted that the state government actually has an involvement of who becomes a rector, a president of public universities. Cutting and divesting certain single-out programs for state-funded institutions. <laughs> Gender studies was an, was an example for that. It wasn't particularly or specifically banned. It was just that, well, no state-funded institutions could run programs in this, um, and no, no state. So there's no state funding for that. If you manage to do it on your own, you know, accreditation is not withdrawn. This is. Uh, but then it was moved to the next level. Certain accreditation of certain programs were also were and, and gender studies also became one of these. <clears throat> so uh, official accreditations were denied for certain programs in certain public universities. Uh, and the top of this, this process was denying and withdrawing accreditation for certain institutions. There was only one so far. This was uh, the institution, my institution I mentioned, the Central European University. So a university was, ex was sent to exile, was expelled from the country. Um, another step taking over the National Accreditation Board, um, and this was also accompanied by nationalizing public education. Um, so we, we, we mostly talk about higher ed. 
but I think public education is also intrinsically connected to this. We've seen both the management, so government centralizing and taking over the management of uh, of public education, as, as well as uh, centralizing and taking control over, over the public education curricula. Highly centralized, very ideological stuff. We also see firing of faculty. It is rare. I'm not saying this is a widespread phenomena, but it also happens. And we see isolated. This is not very, uh, and of, but of course, partly because we have, it's very difficult to get information is, is uh, censorship by blocking academic events that would involve blacklisted human rights NGOs or dissident academics, and also hosting political propaganda events on university premises, launching media campaigns to intimidate critical academics, retaliating against institutions where faculty or students were supporting protest movements. Um, now we also see public education in the center of government attacks. There is a restrictive employment scheme to be pushed through legislation, for example, uh, depriving teachers of right to strike. Um, and two more things in this regard, and I see that my time is coming up, so I will try to wrap up. Uh, the other thing that has happened is reallocating funds to an alternative networks of government dependent and government friendly research institutes and think tanks. So, and gongos, so government uh, organized non governmental organizations. So this is it's the same processes. So taking away money from 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 one and giving to others. So for example, uh, a College of Advanced Studies to train upcoming a new elite for the Orban regime received uh, a subsidy of about $1.5 billion from the government, uh, which actually amounts to the annual budget of the entire higher educational sector. Now, this institution offers monthly $10,000, $15,000 stipends for uh, visitors like Benjamin Harris Queenie from the Daily Express, uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, Dennis Prager were guests here. They gave a 30 minute talks for like $30,000 uh, at a festival. Now this is again from public money, uh and and this is so this amount that these two guys received each uh, is roughly uh, is a four years of salary uh, of the annual salary in, in 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 this country uh in 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 hungary a full professor's annual net salary is about 15000 15000 us dollars the annual salary okay um, and the last thing is what I mentioned is is this is this uh, story of is is this 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 the public universities moved to to foundation controlled uh, um, so semi privatization of the practically the entire higher educational sector. So as I said, this was very carefully planned. This new institution, which is called. Uh, 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 public interest asset man asset management foundations. This is actually something that's written into the constitution. It's the ninth amendment of the constitution. The constitution has been in force for seven years now, or or, so, or uh, for um, sorry for uh, for twelve years now. It already had nine amendments at the time. Uh, uh, and this is basically putting government cronies in the management of these institutions. Okay, so let me just wrap up by by. Uh, pointing to some of the important features of Hungary and I think that the differences between well I was focusing mostly on the US uh, and apologies for uh, for that I I didn't have the mental capacity to so to include a, the broad, a broader uh, take on, on on Americas but so again Hungary unlike Poland unlike Israel and I think unlike the US is a kleptocracy my you know it's there's been lots of you know, assessments on this, what I find most compelling is that, well, actually, there's no ideology behind this. There's lots of ideological talk, but what the Orban, what Orban is interested in is political power. This is an oligarchical economy. This regime is built on EU funds, on multinational companies. Uh, this is this is a form of an authoritarian capitalism. The nomenclature of this kleptocracy is built from, from you know, from these subsidies and multinational companies. Um, and um, and and I think it's it's very important that these illiberal these illiberal moves are very often simply diversions to divert you know that di to divert attention from the real story. Just to give you one example, now there is this discussion going on with the EU with this conditionality uh, procedure where one of the issues that the European Commission said that this is Hungary is in violation of its rule of law commitments is this this uh, the, these these newly formed foundations where these politicians are in the boards and and how these these twenty six uh, public 
or semi-public turned public universities operate. Now, within these discussions, uh, the, the parliament adopted a law, which is only referred to as a spy law. Basically, people can report uh, practically, you know, if you if you see same-sex people, you know, adopting children, and you know, so if you see if you see people who behave in a way that is contrary to the principle, to the to the spirit of the of the new constitution, there's a there's a procedure where you can you know make, where you can make a report, right? So this is even the president, who is was of course a uh, um, uh, um, um, you know, a close ally to Orban, even the president vetoed this legislation. But the whole idea was that this is something what the NGOs, what academics, what politicians should be talking about to divert attention from the talks with the EU, from the failures of, I don't know, foreign policy, of how Orban became the last, you know, how Orban's policy to become the last pet of Putin and vetoing Swedish NATO, you know, accession, etc. So, so again, um, I question the genuine nature of of these ideologically led uh you know some some of the the motive the motivation behind these uh attacks on academic freedom again it it doesn't make these attacks less uh apparent or important um what again what we have to see is that orban has a a, a very stable 25 percent support of the electorate which is always going to be enough for him or it seems like it's going to be enough for him to win elections uh, even if there's a, uh, or or even a two thirds. Uh, another feature of Hungary, there's no practically there's no op opposition because again the entire parliamentary um, work has been emptied out. The air has been sucked out. There's nothing to do in parliament. There's no unions for some reason. Whatever the protests there are and whatever union movements there, are, ironically they are connected to education and higher education. The biggest protests we have were related to, to educational uh, um, issues. Um, okay, one, uh, um, and, and two more things. One is that the cynicism, I think, is beyond imaginable. What we also have to see that what happens, and I think this is a very important and it relates to education. Now for, uh, for any, um, uh, <coughs> Um, sober-minded middle-class Hungarian. This is this is a this is an unconditional truth that you don't want your children to go to university in Hungary, and you don't want to, them to live in this country. Now, this is a catastrophe. This is a national catastrophe. This this self-induced brain drain, I think, is the worst any leader can experience, and none of us uh, to actually create in a country. Okay, so this is, I think, this is this is a very important. Uh, uh, thing. Also, what I have to say that sometimes it is not evident why something was done. For example, banishing Central European University, I'm not sure it, it, it actually paid off in any way. It, had, it was the case that triggered the, 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 the loudest response, um, both on the international political as well as the, 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 the legal level. The largest protest, almost 100,000 people were, were protesting for CEU. Um, um, has led to that. The, this university has actually paid an incredible, you know, quite a substantive amount of money to Budapest. It was uh, it was like uh, up to thirty thousand, uh, thirty million dollars annually to the Hungarian economy. This is this is now always it now goes to Vienna. So this is not entirely, you know. Um, so just to 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 sum up with, uh, and again, I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time with 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 five points that I think. Uh, uh, that are different, uh, again, talking about, about the U.S. in, in, in particular. Uh, so uh, I think as, as useful the Hungarian case can be, I would also need to say that, okay, who, who are the agents that we're talking about? I mean, I think I just say you are, the U.S. is not an autocratic state. It's not an illiberal state. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even one under Trump. And Florida, I don't think, meets the criteria to be an illiberal state, even under DeSantis. Okay, so this is uh, when we talk about illiberalism and populism, uh, the, the, the differences can be very important. I also, I'm not sure I, I can point to the real mo motivation uh, in, in, in what is happening in the US. I see what it is for Orban, it's, it's, it's money and not, it's not genuine ideology, uh, but I think it's worth investigating that. Also, I think there is an incredibly important difference in 
it, you know, when it comes to the U.S., it also applies for Canada, um, is, is the importance of the excellence in higher education. These institutions are the world's leading higher education institutions, which have very important financial consequences. Research, research grants go to these institutions, tuition uh, money goes to this. Orban is uninterested, in fact, counter-interested in a well-educated, critical population. The very idea of this sort of pre-modern, ultra-conservative, underfinanced, low-quality public education and, and something like similar to that in, 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 in higher education is, is what Orban is interested in. Orban is interested in transforming higher education to government propaganda. This is not the trend that we would see, uh, certainly not in the, in the U.S. And, and just two more things, the, 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 the way to move forward, I think, you know, one is has been made very eloquent by... Um, by, by you know scholars at risk uh, is that yes hi, uh, journal, and I think it's it's time it's it's interesting that for example now the the American system of uh, of, of college ranking is shaking and elite institutions are moving out of the traditional schemes it may be the time to to push to 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 get more recognition for academic uh, freedom in in, uh, in 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 academic ranking this you know um and also this the, the last part could be is that uh, also for uh, for funding education especially international ones there has been a very so you know in order for, for for institutions to be eligible to apply for grants one could include an academic freedom integrity and conditionality clause for example european institutions and and again non american illiberal autocratic whatever countries higher education institutions are still very much interested they need money they need international academic funding they need to be part of the international academic competition so this is something um, that's very important there i have to point to one very controversial issue is one of the things that has happened with this conditionality procedure in in, in hungary is that the eu suspended froze subsidies uh, Erasmus and H2020 subsidies to those to these organizations I talked about, which were which were semi privatized to to government cronies. Um, and this was used in a government rhetoric as the EU is punishing Hungarian students and Hungarian academics. I don't think that's the case, but I think this should be debated very thoroughly. And the the the, the very very last comment I have made, and I've made this in some of my writings. I know this is very naive, but uh, but this is something just again to to um to 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 see how much I value you know work done at scholars at risk I think this, you know this this work could be even the portfolio could even be more diversified I could think of uh, of again affirmative action projects for 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 academics again maybe you know germ, germ hydrogen or you know publications could provide a certain degree of protection for academics in peril um you know I we can talk about the procedures but I think um I don't think this is a this is a lost cause because I think uh, um, luckily academic academia is is a is is a very resilient sector. It's it has it has money in it. It has it has power in it, uh, and I think institutions can be <coughs> forced to uh, to to uh, to obey certain uh, unwritten rules. Thank you, and sorry for uh, for taking so much time. Thank you, Andres. I don't think anyone uh, felt that you were compromised by your your infirmity. Uh, you you clearly you're you're uh, thinking about this in a very sophisticated way. And and I think one, um, just one comment on the points you made. You know, I think that the what underlies a lot of what you said is the sophistication of Orban's tactics. It's clear, you know, kind of why so much of those are being drawn on from other by other similarly minded uh, world leaders. Um, uh, next, our next panelist uh, is Andrew Gothard. Um, Andrew earned his BA and MA in English from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, then completed his PhD in working class literature at the University of Miami in 2017. Um, he is the uh, United Faculty of Florida president. Um, and in that role, Andrew has prioritized the diverse and growing needs of UFF's local chapters build real grassroots power in Florida through a shared sense of solidarity and purpose, all to make lasting change for the better in Florida's higher education system, one member at a time. Um, before I let you go, I just realized, Andrew, I, I, I understand we've had a, um, a, maybe a bit of a, of a confusion. We have an, an hour and a half today. Um, so hopefully people can stay the whole session. Uh, uh, there may have been, uh, I, I understand, 
uh, a note in the invitation that it was only an hour, but we do have an hour and a half. So um, there we go. Andrew, please, uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what I can do is start by talking a little bit about who we are at the United Faculty of Florida. And I'm thrilled to see in the attendees list some of our some of our local members. So thanks for being here today. Um, United Faculty of Florida, we are the higher education faculty and graduate assistant union for the state of Florida. We represent the bargaining interest of over 25,000 higher ed, you know, full-time faculty, academic professionals, and graduate assistants at all 12 of our state public universities, 16 state and community colleges. We also have four graduate assistant chapters at some of the major universities. We have four K-12 lab schools that are attached to those universities. And, you know, what, what institution in Florida would be complete without a retired chapter? Right, because we we know what Florida is known for. Um, so we see ourselves as a very important voice, uh, advocating for the needs of faculty, staff, and students on our higher education campuses. And as I was listening to Andras talk about what happened and what is continuing to happen in Hungary, I am struck by the similarities of what Governor Ron DeSantis and his supporters in the legislature, in the Board of Governors, the State Board of Education, on the local boards of trustees for each of these institutions, how they are behaving in very similar ways. So what I want to do with my time today is really focus in on three key areas where we're seeing this influence. The first is in legislative actions that have that have They've, they've really started in about 2021, but they've accelerated over the last few years, especially last year and then, then this year as well. I want to talk about how um, Governor DeSantis and his supporters are trying to control the public narrative around higher education as a way to generate support for a lot of these unconstitutional anti-democratic attacks on our system. And then I want to talk about the impact that we're seeing for faculty and students um, across the state, very similar to what Andras was talking about with the uh, the brain drain and you know individuals who no longer want to be in Florida as a result of these policies. So, um, you know, very similar to what's happening in Hungary, a lot of this is being done under the cover of what they believe is. Uh, the, the rights under the Constitution and the protections under Florida law. Now, there are a number of unconstitutional things they are doing, and I'm going to talk about how we are pushing back at UFF with our allies to challenge those things because we are a very active and aggressive public sector union in Florida. But there is definitely an attempt to um, use legal processes to slowly accrue more and more power to the executive, where Ron DeSantis wants to control every aspect of university life and exert what we call undue political influence over local, local curriculum, student events and activities, research, funding, sort of every area of our university and college experience around the state. So let's start by talking about presidential searches. And, and you're gonna hear uh, a lot of, of comparison between what, what Andres has said and what I'm about to say. And I'm, I'm gonna avoid bill numbers because bless you if you don't have to pay as close attention to the Florida legislature as I do. Um, but if anybody wants specific references for where these bills are coming from, please pop that in the Q&A and I will be happy to provide those references uh, because we, we, we very much have them on hand. But let's talk about executive capture from the top down. So we're going to talk about a bill that was passed last year in 2022 that we, we broadly refer to as presidential searches. And what this bill did uh, was uh, capitalize on an effort by Florida's conservative lawmakers uh, over eight years to take the job searches for our university and college presidents out of Florida's very progressive sunshine laws. So if you're not familiar with that term sunshine laws, it's, it's essentially the laws that allow the public to access a broad array of government information, um, including in this case, the full list of candidates for every uh, university and college president position around the state. And what this did was it, it allowed the public 
the, the students, the faculty to vet these candidates and ensure that political cronies weren't being given jobs running these institutions over highly qualified academic professionals. And for eight years, we had beaten back this onslaught and, and had protected those searches and public access to those searches. And then last year, a handful of Democrats rolled over on us because someone had somehow convinced them that secret searches would lead to better diversity and would allow more candidates of color to get jobs as institutions leading these institutions you know our reply was historically when has secrecy ever benefited marginalized communities but they were convinced and uh, they voted and so now what we're seeing is uh, the ability or the attempt to shoehorn political candidates into leading institutions. Uh, the most recent one that, that I'll, I'll elaborate on a little bit later was Richard Corcoran, who is now the president of the New College of Florida. Uh, Richard Corcoran has no experience as a higher education administrator and has very little higher education experience at all. Um, the a top five research institution in the country, the University of Florida, is now being headed by uh, a Republican senator from Nebraska, Ben Sass, who only had very minimal uh, experience leading a very small liberal arts institution for a short time in the Midwest. Um, and we're hearing now the uh, supposed front runner for the new president of my own institution at Florida Atlantic University is a House Representative, Florida House Representative Randy Fine, who is well known for his attacks on LGBTQ plus individuals, um, attacks on immigrants, and really towing the line of what the governor wants to see uh, in terms of undermining the diversity of our student body and faculty body at our institutions. So this has been a very important step for Governor DeSantis to try to take more control over what's happening at our institutions by controlling those presidential searches. Uh, next up, we have undermining of tenure. Uh, tenure, as, as many of us know, is a protection for faculty of all political persuasions to be able to research, teach, publish, and exist in, a high, in, a, in our higher education system without threat of being terminated, uh, because they are researching or studying information that is inconvenient to a politician, a donor to the institution, um, a friend of a politically connected individual, or, or so on. And that was one of the first places that the governor and his supporters wanted to attack. So last year in 2022, a bill was passed that mandated statewide post-tenure review. Now, we already had post-tenure review in all of our contracts for institutions that grant tenure in Florida. There are 10 universities that grant tenure, and it was created individually to match the, um, the character of those institutions, but they wanted a statewide system, particularly one that uh, could create punishments for faculty who were considered to be quote unquote underperforming. And what that came out to was eventually the governing board that oversees the state university system, which is called the Florida Board of Governors, passed a regulation that um, it, it mandates that post-tenure review every five years, but it does it in such a way that now tenure really no longer exists in Florida. Tenure has become a revolving five-year contract. And the reason we say that is because uh, in this regulation now, it states that if a faculty member has great student evaluations, if they have stellar evaluations from their colleagues, their department chair, and their dean sort of all the way up, the provost has the express written authority to ignore every other evaluation that faculty member has been given to write a new evaluation, which can include uh, an outcome of immediate dismissal. Um, no performance improvement plan, no opportunity to, uh, to uh, meet whatever new standards have been imposed. And anyone with a brain can look at that and know that that is specifically designed to target and remove faculty who are politically inconvenient to, let's say, university presidents who are politically connected to Governor DeSantis. So this is about reaching into our institutions and removing tenured faculty who are not towing the ideal ideological line that the hard right conservatives in Florida are, are presenting to the people. We also have attacks on academic freedom, and this has come in an array of bills. Um, so many of you may be familiar with HB7 from last year, otherwise known as the Stop Woke Act, uh, which attempted to say that, hey, critical race theory and other sorts of um, uh, issues involving, you know, racial history and racial tension in the United States. If you want to, prom if you want to say that uh, critical race theory is terrible and nobody should believe it, 
the state says go right ahead. If you want to present critical race theory as if in a, it objectively to say, oh, here it is, and here's what the critics say, and here's what the supporters say, and you make your own decision, state says you're good to go. But if you want to advocate for critical race theory and say that this is this is an accurate understanding of American history, this is a, an accurate way to understand systemic racism, and I want you as my students to, to know that and know that the evidence supports it, you have now violated state law. So you can criticize, you can be objective, but you can't support. Um, so that was in um, HB7, and I'll, I'll give a little update later on where that is when I talk about our advocacy and, and our ability to fight back in Florida, because we are not taking this shit lying down, I can tell you that right now. Um, there have been other bills that have um, tried to mandate uh, how faculty can and cannot present subject matter. So uh, tried to force faculty to present both sides of an issue, even when the other side is completely illogical or has no evidentiary basis. Um, there has there is currently legislation in the legislature that is trying to compel faculty speech around the teaching of American history to say that faculty cannot distort historical events. And when the question was asked, well, who gets to decide what counts as a distortion of a historical event, it was sort of hand waved off as, oh, we'll figure it out, which means a politician uh, will we'll, we'll decide that. Um, also in, in this most recent bill that's that's up in the legislature, there are requirements that you can only teach American history as the founding of a constitutional republic. And anything that questions that or reads against the grain or maybe undermines or even talks about America's founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson as complex figures who both wrote the Declaration of Independence and owned slaves. And in that dissonance, you can even see the tensions that we have in American society today. You can't do that. Right, that, that's, that's apparently too difficult for uh, Florida's college and university students to understand or grapple with. So they're trying to ban faculty from, um, from teaching about that. They are attempting to defund diversity, equity, and inclusion programs across the state. And we expect that legislation to be signed and passed any day now. Uh, they are empowering the Board of Governors who oversees the university system to give instruction to institutions about removing critical race theory curriculum. Um, uh, th so all of that, plus more, is, uh, is being used to limit and threaten and undermine academic freedom for faculty. And I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit further, too. One of the enforcement mechanisms for the Stop Woke Act, or HB7, uh, is it, it's very chilling when you think about the way that this was um, decided to be enforced. Okay, good, I was checking my time. Uh, the way this was decided to be enforced was that um, if any institution was found in violation of the Stop Woke Act, uh, that institution could lose all of its performance funding, which for some institutions could be as much as $100 million uh, for the next fiscal year. And the way that they decided there had been a violation is you had three options. One was, um, the Florida court system could say there was a violation. The other was the Florida Board of Governors could say there was a violation. And here's the real kicker that I think shows the direction that Governor DeSantis and his supporters want to go. The third is, and this is still, you know, still in the law, that um, uh, a standing committee of the legislature can decide. So that means a committee that is handpicked and appointed by Governor DeSantis and his supporters can make that decision to target and undermine a large swath of a university if anybody steps out of line. So what we're seeing is a broad attempt to chill and limit constitutional speech and activities across our university system. We're also seeing a weakening of accreditors, right? National accreditors who are there to ensure that there are protections for tenure and academic freedom and to withdraw federal uh, tax dollars from those institutions if they don't uphold those. There's been legislation passed in Florida that is designed to allow institutions to sue or undermine um, those, those accrediting bodies to intimidate them into no longer enforcing their rules. Um, and all of this really culminates in what we've recently seen at New College of Florida. Now, I know it's called New College, but it's actually a university. <laughs> and uh, it is it has historically been um, really the, the shining gem of our university system. It has been considered the Honors University of Florida. It has an incredible number of Rhodes Scholars and other individuals uh, who have come out of this institution. 
And recently, Governor DeSantis took the opportunity to appoint six far right ideological conservatives to that board of trustees, a number of whom do not even live in Florida or have a connection to the community or the institution with the express purpose of running liberal students and faculty and, and forcing them out of the institution and installing essentially political puppets to come in and teach only what the governor believes. And I am incredibly proud to say that the reason they have not succeeded so far is because of the work of our members of the United Faculty of Florida at that institution and because of the protections our collective bar of our collective bargaining agreement at that institution. But they are certainly trying and that is uh, very much the blueprint for what they want to do across the state at our much larger colleges and universities. And all this has really been uh, achieved through the focus on the public narrative. So what we've heard time and time again from Governor DeSantis in particular, but also his supporters, are that all faculty are these far left Marxists who are indoctrinating students into believing ideas that are not traditionally conservative. And what we've seen lately is they've had to start walking that back because we keep pushing the facts out to them. We're like, OK, we'll go walk around a campus for five minutes and you'll know that it's not even that all the faculty aren't far left Marxists. The vast majority are not. This is Florida still. <laughs> it's the Southeast part of the United States. This is not where you're gonna find your Marxist, at least not in broad numbers like you're imagining. And so lately they've sort of walked that back and they said, okay, well, um, maybe you're not all Marxist, but you're definitely indoctrinating. And we've said, well, where's that happening? Show us the examples. Cause we already have policies in place uh, that would discipline faculty for forcing students to believe certain ideas. And I don't know if you've been around students in the modern area, but they're not shy about telling you how they feel and telling you to back off if you're being too aggressive about a particular idea. So we said, show us the evidence. And of course, they don't have any. So now, even last week, the comments uh, by, again, Representative Randy Fine and some others were that, okay, well, actually, faculty are still indoctrinating students, but they just don't know they're doing it, right? It's unconscious. So so that's, they keep moving the goalposts backwards because they want to support this public narrative that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is somehow exclusionary. The, the subtext of that being if we're allowing uh, uh, individuals and students of color into our universities and colleges and giving them more opportunities to succeed, or even if we go upon socioeconomic lines, if we're allowing working class students into the academy and giving them opportunities to succeed, then somehow white students are being displaced. So you can hear elements of the great displacement theory and white supremacist rhetoric from around the country that is seeping into uh, what these legislators are complaining about when they want to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion and critical race theory. Um, they're saying that by focusing on systemic inequality in the United States, we are somehow saying that all white people are racist and we're trying to force students into believing that everyone around them is racist and dividing one another. And all of this we should be able to hear is what you typically get when you have an authoritarian regime that is having trouble instilling its ideological narrative upon the people. But that's what they're using. And, and we're seeing it uh, sort of broadly affecting every part of our culture. For instance, um, uh, Equality Florida, an LGBTQ plus advocacy organization recently put out a travel warning uh, for uh, people of, uh, uh, LGBTQ plus background to not even come to Florida because they might be in danger in that space. So we're seeing that impact in those areas. And um, what we're also seeing is that faculty and students are fleeing the state. Uh, faculty are not taking jobs here and are seeking jobs elsewhere. We think we'll have the hard data on that in the next 30 to 60 days because this is the time of year when we really will know who's leaving and who's coming. We're at the end of the spring academic semester. Um, but a, a recent example was quoted by a Democratic senator in the House or in the Senate Education Appropriations Committee that he had spoken to an unnamed university recently, HR director, and that over 300 faculty positions had been reconsidered in the last 30 days at that one institution. And that matches what we're hearing as well. Faculty are leaving. Students do not want to go to school here. They want to go to school where they're going to have full, broad educational opportunities, uh, where they're going to have um, and be treated equally, where they're going to have full access to their rights. And so, you know, even if we're able to stop a lot of this legislation and these attacks, we're worried that the fix may already be in, um, in terms of the long-term damage to higher education. 
But I want to end on a really positive note. And that is that I am incredibly proud of the work of the United Faculty of Florida, because unlike what Andras was saying, I, mean, I think we've seen so many similarities in what we're saying. Unlike that, we do have a very strong union culture in Florida. And one of those unions is the United Faculty of Florida. We have been pushing back at every level of society with local protests and teach-ins, speaking truth to power through the press, um, and op-eds, controlling the public narrative that public education is about the public good. We've been advocating in the legislature and working with our allies to diminish the impact of some of these bills. And we are taking the state to federal court. We've already done it once and we're gonna do it several more times in the next uh, six to eight months to challenge the constitutionality of these laws and really make these legislature, legislators own up to these attacks. Now, that has also put a target on our backs. I mean, the legislature is trying to destroy public sector unions in Florida right now, but all I'll say is we're ready for that. They can bring it on. We're not going away. And even if for some reason the United Faculty of Florida was, was to have to get into a rebuilding mode for a while, you can't silence the people of Florida. And Ron DeSantis is going to learn that very soon. Well said. Um, that, that, is, that is the rare inspirational note in these conversations. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for that. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, only, the only comment that I would make, I mean, there's, there's so much in there. Um, I do think that the trying to separate out what's academic freedom from what rights, what other rights are, are uh, implicated by a lot of the things you said is almost, you know, it's almost pointless. I think everything, everything we're talking about um, comes back to academic freedom. And I think, I think, you know, if we get, if we get into the details somewhat in, Q, in the Q&A, we'll, we'll be able to sort of, sort of pull out the academic freedom piece on, on each of these issues. But um, uh, just a fascinating presentation. Um, so our final speaker is Anne McCall. Uh, Anne McCall is currently Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at Xavier University in Louisiana, where she's a professor in the Department of Languages. Uh, Dr. McCall was, was recently named 13th President of the College of Worcester in Ohio. Uh, since jo joining Xavier in 2016, Dr. McCall has collaborated with faculty, staff, students, alumni, and community organizations to create and implement a new core cur curriculum and nearly two dozen new graduate and undergraduate degree programs in areas of growing student interest, emerging knowledge, and professional opportunities. Um, uh, Dr. McCall is committed to nurturing an environmental environment conducive to global learning and dedicates herself to equity and physical, intellectual, and collective freedom in the U.S. and around the world. As current chair of the Steering Community Committee for the U.S. Section of Scholars at Risk, Dr. McCall works to support academic freedom and university values around the world by supporting persecuted scholars seeking placements, advocating for the freedom of jailed scholars and practitioners, and promoting more broadly the freedom to think. Dr. McCall, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. And I've learned so much from my co-panelists today. I'm very grateful for what they're doing in their work, as well as for their words here. Before I launch into what I'd like to talk about more uh, seriously, which is what to do. Um, I just like to say that while we can be encouraged and must be encouraged and inspired by the work of our colleagues in Florida right now, we need to remain sober about the fact that this legislation is spreading across the country and that it's pretty much like a cancer and we need to pay very strong attention to it and fight uh, really for the lives of our universities and beyond that, um, for the minds and the potential of young people today. In joining the College of Worcester in, Je in July, I have to do a little shout out to my future institution because they were famous a hundred years ago for opposing William, uh, William Brian Jennings, who wanted to defund the college uh, because the president continued to support the teaching of evolution by the faculty and uh, refuse to back down on that. So the challenges of the day may be different, the subjects that uh, are being fought over, but the temptations of outsiders without knowledge and expertise in particular areas, disrespecting the expertise of faculty and the autonomy of institutions is something that we need to guard against always. Okay, so 
you know, what's happening is scary, right? And I think, whoops, excuse me, I'm having a technological moment here. All right. And um, so what to do? And when I say that, I'm not saying it in the what to do and shrug our shoulders mode. It's more, okay, what really do we need to do both as a reaction to this and as preparation for uh, the future? So we need to protect ourselves from oppressive actions to be sure. We need to create conditions for vibrant thinking, teaching, research on vital topics of the day. Those topics will always be controversial, right? If we already had the answers, we wouldn't need to be working so hard uh, to, to do the, the, the research and the teaching to learn about them. And if we think that certain subjects are free from controversy today, we need to think about the fact, and so therefore we don't need to worry about them. We need to think about the fact that that's not necessarily true, true over time. I will mention just one example that's close to me because of living in New Orleans. Um, one famous case from the post-Katrina period is, um, comes from a research faculty member who did not benefit from tenure, who was um, a highly regarded um, Dutch geologist who was the one who cracked what it was that broke so many of the levees in the New Orleans area. There were 25 uh, that broke and they weren't, they weren't built properly for the type of soil that they were on. So it was a real specialist kind of question. When he figured this out, he was lauded as a great geologist at first. That is until the Corps of Engineers started having conversations from what we've been told with LSU and with the state about funding for rebuilding. Suddenly, he went from being praised, you can look at it in the press, extensively to not renewed. Now, it's not regularly that a geologist would be thought of as teaching a controversial subject, right? But in truth, we never know. And so all of us, while we may think today, that's not my subject area that's most involved, it may be tomorrow. Okay, so um, Jesse mentioned the tracking of reports of violations in the world. And uh, I think it's important to remember that the Academic Freedom, Freedom Monitoring Report has been kept since 2012, and I encourage everybody to sign up for this. This is under the my first bullet, which is get and stay informed. Now, none of us are going to become or almost none of us are going to become experts in this as people who spend their full time uh, jobs working on the topic. But all of us can become better informed. All of us can learn more specifically about what constitutes academic freedom and also how the issues that we're experiencing are not unique to us. They're not unique to our institutions. They're not unique to our states. So I encourage you to sign up for that. I also encourage you to read the Scholars at Risk yearly report, uh, Freedom to Think. Uh, last year's report, I believe it's last year's report, featured Brazil, Iran, and the United States. Um, but reports are provided on all countries who have uh, been signaled out for reports. Pan America also has an online index of executive orders, proposed legislation, and signed laws that you can look up that's um, published on a regular basis uh, or updated on a regular basis. And you can also link to the specific laws or the specific executive orders. So you can see really what states right now have gag orders. Are they just for K-12 education? Do they involve higher ed? If so, how? Are state agencies involved? Um, there is, there is wide-reaching conversation across the country. Uh, it's very clear in the copycat legislation where the same vocabulary is used. So we should become aware of that. Um, and we should look to our neighbors and others in the world for inspirational and aspirational initiatives. As an example of encouraging signs, the Organization of American States has an arm called the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This group in partnership uh, with other organizations authored the Inter-American Principles of Academic Freedom and Institutional Autonomy in 2021. Now this is on top of UN documents that Jesse can talk more about in the Q&A if you'd like, um, but there's a legal foundation, an international legal foundation through the UN for academic freedom. And we have interstate um, initiatives that are giving it more teeth and that others that people are referring to in their actions and it is being picked up around the globe by other groups. 
uh, we in the United States should be aware of the fact that there is momentum building elsewhere. There are conversations being had across countries and we should see ourselves not simply in our, international, in our national context, but in a global context, both of persecution and of pushing back and really thinking about what universities are supposed to be doing as part of our work. If we look to our friends in Western Europe, note that the Humboldt Foundation with whom Scholars at Risk regularly partners or fundamentally partners is a major source of emergency fellowships for endangered scholars around the world, right? Financially, just a really unmatched uh, source of funding and support. Since the retreat from Afghanistan and the war in Ukraine, membership in Scholars at Risk in the United States has grown significantly, and many of our member universities have begun hosting scholars from around the world, right? So Scholars at Risk institutions may always make, uh, may get involved by hosting scholars. They come from who have applied for uh, special temporary homes and refuges uh, at universities in the United States. Um, if you look at it, it's, a, it's actually a very sad um, fact to see that they come from around the world. But right now with the push uh, because of Afghanistan and Ukraine, we have more people um, looking at hosting scholars from everywhere. So these scholars enrich our campuses with their expertise and their experience. And they remind us of the ties that bind us through our ambition to think freely, as well as from the danger that exists at all time. Thinking freely is not something that all societies want at any given time in their history. And you know, as we work in our universities, we know that when we're on the edge of ideas, we're being judged by our colleagues. We have peer review and we test our ideas out with other people. Some will be wrong, right? Some will be going in the right direction. Um, they will, they'll be controverted and we will get to more accurate knowledge, richer understandings of life. We have to be able to sit with that knowledge that this is what we do and this is what this is why we are valuable right so we must uh, protect that and embrace it as something that's uh, that's actually part of being part of a prosperous society that the society creates a space in it in which well trained individuals and groups of individuals are going to do their hardest to think about solving issues and coming up with understandings of our societies that may be at odds, that will often be at odds if we're producing new knowledge with what we think or have thought in the past is true. You know, I personally think a lot about how the fact that philology used to be a very controversial topic, right? It may be again for all that I know, right? Um, but those topics change over time. All right, second of all, we need to work on maintaining and nurturing academic freedom and higher education values on our own campuses, right? We need to understand that we are part of this. So it's not just us against the world or us against our political leaders or outside um, uh, forces that are trying to make decisions on our behalf in our areas of expertise, but we need to become vectors and participants in this quest for uh, thinking freely on topics that are hard. So Scholars at Risk has excellent materials to help us all promote higher education values on our campus. You can read more elsewhere, but elements involve ritualizing it. You know, regular talks on it, for example. But we also sponsor or help people learn how to um, teach advocacy seminars where they take up the case of a particular persecuted scholar around the world and think about together as students and faculty members about what levers to pull to try to help that, that scholar. There's a scholars in prison project. Um, there's much more. We can host, so um, we should also think about how we're part of an ecosystem of, of people and groups around the world that do this work. So for instance, we work with Scholar Rescue Fund, the IE, we work with CARA, we work um, with disciplinary uh, groups, right? Almost every major national and international disciplinary group has a committee on academic freedom. 
AAAS does, MLA does, APA. So if you look to your own groups, you're going to find materials as well as approaches to thinking about the uh, issues um, that can help you in your work on your own campuses. Third, I would say get involved in supporting the work beyond your campuses. You know, if we don't, why should anybody else care? So we have, we have become over the past, you know, several decades, much more atomized. And some people would talk about how there's hardly a campus community anymore. Um, whoops, can you see me? My screen has just went blank, gone blank. Yes, we can see you, Anne. Okay, excellent, excellent, it's back. All right, I can, I can see at least a few of you now. So what kinds of organizations outside our direct areas should we get involved in? Of, and should we follow for this? Um, AAUP is a prime uh, advocate in the United States. Its committee A is particularly focused on this issue. PEN America dedicates itself to the freedom to write. The Coalition for Academic Freedom in the Americas is a new group, again, as Jesse mentioned at the beginning, founded by um, uh, University of Toronto with um, Monterey. Did I say Toronto? I meant Ottawa. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and now being supported by the Open Society Network. It's a, it's a great initiative as well. So to speak for a moment about scholars at risk, I'm particularly attached to it personally because we put the higher education values, a set of five key values at the heart of what we do and that help us understand academic freedom. So institutional autonomy is, as Jesse said, the bedrock for academic freedom. Academic freedom also makes sense and only makes sense in a context where there are other fundamentals. So community responsiveness, access and accountability. And all of these five values circulate and work together. And sometimes they rub up against each other and they also exist in local and regional contexts, right? Um, but when we think about our work, why, does it, why is it important? Why do we need to care about it? Because together these values say what we do and allow us to be uh, pro proponents of excellence in the search for knowledge. Now, I'm inspired. I really am, in spite of the difficulties, by the over 600 institutions that are part of Scholars at Risk. Um, we're also, we are part of a global network of institutions that have signed on to this to become a member. The institution needs to say that it supports academic freedom. So that's already a good step. Um, and to be dedicated really to the development of human potential and knowledge. We have serious problems, um, very serious ones. And I just wanna take a second to think for just for one tiny minute about what it means to suppress knowledge. Knowledge has been suppressed. What, we're, what is going on in the United States right now is a reaction to the opening up of knowledge. So I think a lot these days about the fact that when I was growing up in Ohio, I knew nothing. When I say nothing, I mean, I did not know that there were race riots in 1829. I did not know that there were black laws in 1807 that limited the ability of, of African descendants to move to the state and that they needed a special $500 bond to be able to do so. I did not know that, but the knowledge was there. It was not being taught. So we don't want, I, I did not know uh, anything about women's history. I didn't know uh, about what it meant to be a head of household until uh, past the middle of the 20th century. I didn't know the restrictions on credit. So all of this means that personally, I'm speaking personally now, I didn't understand what I was seeing around me. The explosion of knowledge on topics of race and gender and ethnicity today, right, allows us to see things, doesn't tell us what to think about them, it allows us to see things that we just don't understand otherwise. And I think we have to be clear with ourselves that some of what we're seeing today is a reaction to the exposition of knowledge that those people in my generation and younger ones have been denied in the past. And that um, I for one would not wanna to deny to others. So we have serious problems. We're also not alone. 
And that is for me a source of strength and hope. Thank you. Again, multiple, multiple inspirational uh, panel discussions. This is a very, very rare thing. Um, thank you, Anne, so much for that. Um, so I, I can't see whether we have any, any questions in the Q&A, but I would like to invite um, any of our, our guests to, uh, to ask any questions if you haven't already done so. Um, it looks like, Kathleen, are, do you see any, are there any questions currently? No, I just saw a comment uh, from Lily View, Lee View. Uh, it's just a comment between the um, the connection between the uh, the Hungarian situation and the Florida um, state of things. So, if I may, I will I will uh, write um, read it so the other uh, attendees can just uh, be aware of the of the comment. In a classical Hungarian epic poem, the hero bravely closes, crosses in one step the border between Poland and India. Why care about Viktor Orban? Um, give me two seconds. And his policies included with regard to academic freedom because models, bad models too, travel between neighboring countries. For this purpose, Hungary and Florida and neighboring countries like Poland and India in that poem. And this has a lot to do with ideology and political regime models. Governor DeSantis plays exactly from the urban playbook, rule by law, nor not rule of law, for example, but it's not only him, for more than a decade, Hungary, a country of bravely 10 million people from Central Europe, has, um, sorry, it's just disappearing. Oops. Why you why don't, find why, why don't you uh, include the, uh, paste the link in, in the, uh, in the chat. Exactly. So can read. No, I, I would just about to finish. Uh, has been a pace setter in countering democratic freedom, including academic freedom. They adopted early and not forward and put forward new populist other authoritarian models that others follow later on in Europe and now in the US. That is at least in part what it makes elsewhere too. So that is the comment. The comment came from, uh, he was actually the provost and prorector of CEU at, in office at the time of the, when the university was expelled. So mm -hmm. give a context. Uh, that's yeah. important context. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Um, uh, the, so my, I, I guess I would just, uh, before ending, just pose, raise one question for both uh, Andrew and Andres, and I, I guess I'd like to hear you briefly comment on the sort of before things got really bad um, or dangerous um, in your respective spaces. Um, you know, how would you how would you rate your colleagues' general understanding of academic freedom? Do you think it, do you think that that these were conversations that were happening on campuses? Do you feel uh, that uh, people were generally prepared for what came, that they understood the attacks as violations of academic freedom, um, or, or was there sort of a, a deficit in that regard? Um, so I, I can start with Florida. Uh, th there are really two different groups to think about. If, if you're discussing UFF leaders, uh, yes, we, we do have a very strong history of academic freedom. Uh, and understanding of it. And we have a very broad interpretation of academic freedom that encompasses freedom of speech and other issues on campus. Um, but if you were thinking about sort of the broader population of faculty in Florida, I would say no. I think a lot of them sort of took for granted that these rights were fundamental to higher education and they could not be overturned. And I, I will say the vast majority 
have been awakened now that uh, rights only exist as long as you have people who are willing to fight for them and enforce them. Um, so, you know, that that sort of great awakening to use that term is is coming. But uh, no, historically, I, I don't think there was a broad awareness of academic freedom and what it really meant uh, to the higher education community here. Thank you. And Andres, what about you? Yeah, uh, well, I think this is this is um, a, a, a perfect litmus test for for Hungarian society, and I I've, I fail to have an answer to why. I, I can tell you that yeah, I think it was completely you know everyone ex could have expected it, and very little uh, resistance has been had been put up. Uh, less or certainly not more than than at other segments of society, even though people's you know so. Um, we are, you know, or Orban is being, um, you know, re-elected for the fourth time with a two-thirds majority uh, in Hungary. We don't know what would have happened if he was to lose the elections, but but you know, we cannot, uh, we we cannot um, uh, negate this fact. And um, I I don't see uh, I don't I don't see much of a resistance, even though our the quality of life, the security of of every academic, whether they are. Uh, whether they are in the medical field or uh, or or they're in social sciences, this is not that much different. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm afraid this is this is the very uh, um, saddening difference between uh, between Florida and 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 Hungary, as as Andrew pointed out. Um, and um, yeah, hey, thank you, thank you for that. Um, well, we so I, I guess I. I Sure. You so just just one sentence. Seconds? I know we're out of time. Is is because I, I very much like the way you introduce this. Whether you know is academic freedom, uh, you know the, the the talking about it as a as a freedom of expression is just, is a clear derailment and it's more about autonomy. But I would just need to you know as a as a constitutional lawyer working in intention, I, I would just need a, a, would add a, th a third dimension to it. So I, I if you know academic freedom to me is not only a first generational hu human right in the sense that it's it's to protect from state infringement. It's also a second generation thing with a duty on behalf of the state to promote and to protect. It's a public community, absolutely. even if it's private institutions out there. Sorry, just, just one. No, no, you're absolutely right. There are, there are a set of obligations that universities, states, and societies have when it comes to academic freedom. That is very Sorry. much the conversation that we are, uh, we are engaged with. So thank you for adding that. Um, and you're muted, but please. Uh, yes. So I see a question in the chat and I feel compelled to answer even though we're at closing time. The question about reaching out to colleagues in secondary schools. One of the things you'll note if you look at um, the, index, the index list of laws that are being passed around the country is that speech is highly uh, constricted in the K-12 educational area. So school boards in America have always had local uh, prerogatives over what can be taught in schools, that's not new. And things that could be taught in one part of the country would not be taught in another. That has now gotten ex uh, quite extreme. And so the very things that we would wanna make sure that the students know before they get to college is they're exactly what we're not sure if they are going to know before they get to college. We also understand that in some states, we're going to end up having some strange conversations, I don't know how they will end up, but with, um, if we have dual enrollment, for example, this is too technical for this conversation, so I'm only saying it as, if we have dual enrollment or some AP courses in high schools for college credit, um, first of all, with dual enrollment, will there be an issue because of things that might be taught in a college that might not be allowed to be taught in, in a high school now? And there are questions with APs also, I would say that there is more hope in these in some of these states within the private education system systems or sector than in the public ones. Most states are not passing as much legislation around colleges and universities that are private. However, in some states, they use financial levers to uh, make that be the same. So in states, for example, that do um, capitation subsidies for private uh, institutions, putting that on the docket would be another way to try to uh, purchase compliance. But in, in any event, the, we, have, we have states that can hardly talk about uh, slavery in terms that one would associate with 
the knowledge that has been created in the past 50 years. Thank you. As an example. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to close um, with, with this. Um, we've been talking a lot about law and policy and um, sort of top end uh, actions that have huge impl Im impacts on all of us, all of our colleagues, our students, our societies. Um, and that is absolutely the right way to look at it. But um, without the building of serious networks that are having deep, penetrating conversations about what, what this set of rights is, what is academic freedom, um, how, is, how are our lives impacted by erosions of it, um, without those conversations happening on all of our campuses, in all of our communities, um, not much is going to change. This is not only going to be um, something that, you know, the, the things that we want to accomplish are not only going to be accomplished through legal advocacy, um, they're going to have to be uh, accomplished through community building, through networking, through sharing, through um, a conversation that really becomes the water that we're swimming in, so to speak. Um, on campuses, in societies. That's what the Coalition for Academic Freedom in the Americas is about. That's what we've set out to do. Um, I see it mirrored in some of the things that Andrew discussed with uh, the, the strength of uh, the unions in Florida. Um, Anne mentioned a number of other institutions that are, are working toward the same conversation. Um, personally, I think that the most important thing we can do is imbue as many of the conversations that we're having on a day to day basis with the types of issues that we talked about today as possible. Um, that is that is how we build up bulwarks against the kinds of attacks that we're seeing grow. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, with that, I have nothing further. Um, so I think it I think we're we're fine to close. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you.